don't know the real us, we're America's most tortured podcast, The Pod People. It's your Garmon Boisia, Matisse Van Rossum. I'm Ben, and I have to say, I was so ready to say my full spiel backwards, but after this whole ordeal of getting this podcast episode set up, I just want to <laughs> die. <laughs> it's been an ordeal. Hello, my name is Cleveland Mosier, and that's a damn fine cup of coffee. Well, we have a double special episode tonight because it's our first ever double guest episode. We have returning guests, Katie and Sarah, both joining us again tonight. How are y'all doing? Doing great. Doing fine. Thank you, Tease. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so glad to have y'all as always. Uh, and yeah, let's just get right into it because I think this is going to be a beefy episode. We are discussing the 1992 film Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me, the prequel film to accompany the uh, cult sensation from 1990. Uh, apparently... Katie and Sarah are our resident Twin Peaks experts, uh, and we've also got a Twin Peaks newbie here. This was Cleveland's uh, first time through the show and Firewalk with me. It was, um, and wow, <laughs> uh, what a what an experience! What a ride, y'all! Thank you so much for taking me along for it as well. I I really appreciate it. It's been such a gift getting to see such a, a fundamental, influential part of drama television and what's clearly an inspiration for so many other things that I love. And it just it's it's such a hub of connection points and it's helped build my language a little bit. And there's just so many references to this show out there and like there it, it just allows me to have like so many more rich conversations with like other horror enthusiasts and such because it's such a such a keystone. Yeah, I mean, the show is just a masterwork. And we should mention, Firewalk With Me, while it's a prequel, you should definitely watch the show first. Yes, yes uh, I, I think that that is an understatement. I did not see Firewalk With Me before the show, but I cannot imagine how anybody would even begin to parse this movie if they didn't have the context of the original series. I, I think I would argue that it's... It's kind of a challenging film, even even with for the yeah, context definitely. of Twin Peaks. Um, I I think it's really interesting in that way because this was coming off the heels of the show, which was uh, a hit, uh, it's very but got popular. canceled after yeah. the second season. Um, but you know, people were going into this film when it came out expecting answers you know that second season ends with a big cliffhanger that i won't elaborate too much on but this completely goes the other way and even more than that it radically in your face at the beginning of the movie tells you that this isn't going to be the tv show i love how they do that the first shot you see in the movie really is a tv being smashed Mm -hmm. And yeah. after that, the whole beginning 20 minutes with Kiefer Sutherland is almost them doing the exact opposite of the show. These... Don't forget Chris Isaac. Yes, either. yes. Chris Isaac. Mm -hmm. uh, they go in as FBI agents to a hostile police station <laughs> with some very, very funny characters. Gone uh, is the folksy friendliness of the of the Twin Peaks Sheriff's Department. Yeah. They, they go out of their way for like so many of like the key places in Twin Peaks and they show us this like this juxtaposition of it, not only mm -hmm. the police department, but also like the suburban homes are replaced with like the trailer park. The the double R the lovely like like touch of the fifties double R diner has been replaced with this like sleazy like greasy diner. We're just seeing all of like the the lovely beautiful like synthetic like cherry pie American artifice just stripped away. Yeah. It's painful. Like it was it it, it it was like physically painful for me like in the diner especially because I was just like 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 as soon as I walked out I'm like oh a diner oh no no you're this, waiting isn't, in, this like, isn't my diner yeah the, the you're waiting room. for the damn this fine a, cup of coffee this isn't the double R what's going it. on Dude, that's no. also a callback to the pilot the flashing light when they're in the morgue, morgue. in the pilot mm -hmm. versus the flashing light in the in the diner 
I hadn't made that connection before, but that was thrilling for me. There's something about that wave-like repetition of a pattern, whether it's in the audio or whether it's in flashes of light Mm -hmm. happening with all of the sequences with Laura when she's kind of in the liminal space between the worlds, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. (laughs) But I, I think it's such a good way to start the movie and directly emphasize that this is very different than what the show is, and you should just know that off the top. You know, this isn't going to be Nadine throwing high school boys. <laughs> this, yeah. isn't, oh, dear. this isn't going to be 90 minutes of James sulking. Subplots. Yeah. You know? I'm, well, I'll be real, though. I think, I think one of the most horrifying things about Twin Peaks is probably the Nadine arc. Like, yeah, that one like is probably one of the most deeply disturbing. I wish, yeah, what in, the, in Twin Peaks. Like, that arc is what real, I wish was not there. It's, it, it's pretty wretched. If we were to deep dive into that one, but we don't, we don't have to. But uh, to get back into the prefacing, I do think it's going to be very difficult for us to talk about this show with any sort of framing for people who haven't seen it. I don't, yeah. I don't think that's possible. This like, is so for this is maybe one of our most niche episodes yet. Mm-hmm. Like I don't, if you haven't seen Twin Peaks, I don't think you're honestly going to get that much out of yeah, this. You're gonna be very so confused. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You uh, can try to listen to us ramble through this. It's but. on Netflix. Go it, check it out. Um, well, no, it's on uh, well, HBO Max. The show is on net. The show is on yeah. Netflix. But a uh, Fire Walk with Me is on cri- the Criterion streaming network and so, HBO Max. Yeah. So I, I definitely think yeah, like for our for our, uh, fresh listeners is that that warning should should be left out there but you know in the, in the lynchian fashion like being thrown into nonsense and just hearing us talk about like obscure references for a little while without context could also have merit i guess i, I don't know decide for yourself well i'd like to provide before we get too into specifics i'd like to provide a little bit of context for this film uh as ben said it was released after the show, after the show was canceled and left on a cliffhanger. People thought that they were going to get some answers, and it's really very different than what you would expect from a Twin Peaks film coming off of the original series. It is only David Lynch and not Mark Frost, so pretty much all of the soap opera y stuff is gone. There's a little bit of hints of it here and there. Uh, A little bit of James. Himbo James. Himbo James. Himbo James. It's much, much darker because they could do things that they couldn't get away with on primetime television. There's definitely still plenty of moments of, like, Lynchian humor, but... A lot of this is like very, very heavy and uh, and depressing. <laughs> and apparently this was planned to be the first of a trilogy of Twin Peaks films that were supposed to explore more of the mythos of the Black Lodge and actually answer unanswered questions from the end of season two. However, people hated this one so much because it was so unlike the Twin Peaks that they knew and loved, that it was a commercial and critical disaster. Didn't it get booed at Cannes? I think so. Whoa. And uh, and so the other two in the trilogy were never realized. Um, well, I'm sure some of that made it into The Return, which I haven't seen all of, so I, I can't say for sure. Yeah, and I mean, I have to admit, the first time I saw this movie, I wasn't a huge fan of no it, me either to be completely honest me either it was only on rewatches that i've come to appreciate it more because i think it is one of david lynch's most challenging works yeah you which know? is saying a lot yeah which is yeah. saying a lot because it's maybe not his most abstract but there's so much context that needs to be known with it yeah i don't know it's just very very dense in its own way yes so Twin Peaks, the show, is centered around, like, soapy drama and noir, right? At face value, like, when you remove the surrealism, you have a plot line that's not too dissimilar from Chinatown. And there's something to be said about noir circling the darkness, that nebulous black hole that we are very slowly introduced to in Twin Peaks. I think our first sighting of the Black Lodge with Cooper is like in like the fourth or so episode, I want to say, third. If, like, you, you have to get, you know, a good ways into it before like the surrealism really kicks. 
and not only the surrealism, but the true darkness of it. In, in a PG television format, there's that, that careful, like, a, like, circling around the rim of the evil. Like, it's the plot, the central, like, hub of it is who killed Laura Palmer and why, and learning about it and, and gaining that information is all about circling that, that abyssal hole, and this film just is it. Like, it is that dark center of Twin Peaks, and... Whoa, yikes. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> like, the main story is the last few days of Laura Palmer's life, like, from her perspective. Whereas in the show, we spend the whole first season and the first half of the second season finding all of those little details and, like, slowly putting together this puzzle till we have the whole picture. And this film is that picture just like in your face, not in pieces. Like it's, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's extremely dark. Yeah. And I don't know if I wanted it. <laughs> um, jury's still out on that one. Maybe I'll have an answer by the end of the podcast after, uh, hearing y'all's delightful takes, but you're, you're drawn in by the mystery of it. And then you fall in love with this town and you fall in love with the people in it. And, and that part of, like, the circling around the darkness is, like, what really, like, drew me in and attached me to this series. Okay. And the fear of Bob, like, lingering is, is amazing. Like, and it is terrifying in the show. But to actually be, like, made to sit down and, and stare into that void in this movie was... It was a hell of a lot. It's extremely heavy. And, and considering, like, again, like, the rating of the show and, like, the level of of horror and gratuity compared to this film is it's it's earth and mars i know this is a horror podcast and i should have like <laughs> i guess been expecting it to some degree because the whole time i was watching twin peaks i was i was just was in the back of my head there was just a little question like i mean it's surreal and it's dark and like there there's dark stuff alluded to uh, but we're gonna watch this, the film on the podcast. Yeah, this is a horror movie. <laughs> it is absolutely a horror, movie. a horror movie. And oh wow, I yeah, I, I don't know. I, I you'd think I'd be, I would have been ready for it in that respect, and I wasn't. I, what were you expecting? Okay, so before I answer that, I wanna I wanna answer a quick thing about what I was expecting out of the end of the show. I'm still trying to figure out if I'm glad or not. I didn't get it. There's a small part of myself that is sad, but the intellectual part of myself is glad I didn't get it, and that is. An ending where Wyndham Earl being possessed by Bob allowing Cooper to kill Bob is how I thought the show was going to end, okay. which is very, it's very Disney, frankly. Like, that would have been, like, it, it wouldn't have been good, but I would have been happy, <laughs> if that makes sense, um, as opposed to, like, Cooper being, you know, taken by Bob and that being our ending. God damn it. Like, no, Cooper. And, like, I'm still... I remember uh, screaming if, out loud. Yes, I remember like, screaming. And just me too. Like, the yeah, first time yeah. I saw it in no! high school, <laughs> I was like, "What? No, <laughs> oh, boy, Dale! Uh, like, no, 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 no!" Yeah, it was it, like, "No, I can't. This can't be it." And then the discovery. I'm trying to go to the next episode. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like this can't be. And I mean, if audiences were angry about anything, it's it's not getting resolution there. Uh, like. God damn it. Like, and then I you start know. Fire Walk with me, and you're like, I don't know these characters. Who are yeah. these people? Yeah, you took Cooper from me, and you've replaced it with, like, <laughs> Kiefer fucking with Sutherland. Chris Isaac? How with Chris dare Isaac, you? yeah. Like, yeah, no, no wonder people were pissed. What like, a I... wicked game you play, David Lynch, <laughs> yeah. honestly. Yeah, like, like, how dare you do that to my heart? And uh, I, I respect it. I respect the shit out of it. Um, to, to be, like, so driven by your vision, like... To, to not give a shit and to tell the story that you need to tell because clearly this one did. I think if anything is clear about about that and about Lynch, like this this show is him, I'm, I'm guessing and I'm projecting, but like it is him trying to get out something, you know, like a, a part of himself that he needs to say. In that same respect that like Stephen King is often known for like writing his horror as him talking about the things that he's most afraid of, that part of yourself that you don't want to look at. And I think that there's a need there, and it's the same thing that that horrifies us about this work so much, or at least horrifies me, is that turning of the mirror in on the self. And it's it just, he, he does it in a way that is, like, via the surrealism that is more relatable than any straightforward film could 
could do it. Well, you because were talking I'm, I'm about this space. a little bit, Sarah, That's after the movie, is how dark. Lynch has such a human element to mm -hmm. all of it, where there's no real black and white to the characters. They're so yeah. multifaceted and complex. Yeah, like how he's able to hold compassion through the narrative for every character, even though he's portraying horrific acts that they commit. Especially in this case, Leland, mm -hmm. because you do get these moments where you have the context of Leland coming back to himself. Mm -hmm. And you can watch his face kind of slip away and become Bob. And then he wildly oscillates back into Leland and occupies some kind of middle ground between them where he's having to balance these personalities. But one thing that I thought about going into this episode of Pod People is like, how can you just talk about Fire Walk With Me? You can't. Like, it, it exists in this world of Twin Peaks. Yeah. That makes it kind of difficult because you want to like you want to make it movie specific generally when you're talking about a feature you want you want to be specific to the film but this when, is more of a discussion of twin peaks in general yeah I think. yeah yeah. Oh, yeah it just made me think about the scene in season two where leland says i didn't kill anybody because he's possessed by Bob. So there's some aspect of Leland that can separate himself, that can disassociate from the activities of his body because his spirit is compromised. I, and I love that Lynch is able to use the tools that he has as a filmmaker to toe the line between realism and whatever else there can be. Like you can, you can portray realistic elements. You can build sets and and costume characters and still turn it into something that exists in a dream world that that becomes part of like an archetypical landscape rather than leaving things just on the surface and we can get comfortable when we're on the surface but it's because lynch will go there and be like no i'm gonna see what's going on in your small intestine I think Leland is such a great example of that because some of the props for that have to be given to Ray Wise's performance. Oh, oh he's so good. Because it's so many. It's almost class. a career-defining performance. Like, the amount of things you can extrapolate just from, you know, minor expressions that he does where you can see some of that switch between the oscillation between the two, like you said, I, I think it's so brilliantly done and it's so understated in most of the movie. You know what reminded me of is uh, someone with Alzheimer's and having those moments of lucidity. And uh, in particular, like my, uh, my grandfather had it and there was a time, and I, I heard this recounted to me, but it was, um, he, was, he was sitting down with my mom at the dinner table and it was like fairly early on, like when he was still showing the signs, they didn't know he had had it yet where he he was sitting down at the dinner table and he recited all 12 of the dogs that he had in his dog sled team. And my mom didn't realize that that was his brain deleting the information. And she has always been like cursing that she didn't write the names down in that moment because he could never remember them again after that. And it's that same moment of lucidity, like that that moment where Leland tells her like tells laura that he loves her is just his his last moment of lucidity before bob takes him because like what is how does Until... bob describes leland as a babe in the woods yeah. on the tv show it's just bob you know he it was leland was always lost until leland uh, until bob leaves leland in the right. show right yeah. that's his last moment yeah i one of one of the most devastating parts of this movie is laura's and and Leland's connected uh, sort of realization that Bob is her father because like she says in this movie that like Bob has been coming to her and raping her since she was 12. And we know from the show that Leland was possessed by Bob when he was 12. So he's had Bob in him for his entire life, but neither of them have realized what 
is happening until like a few days beforehand and i've always interpreted that as like bob letting them see each other for the first time to harvest maximum garmin bosia pain and suffering mm-hmm. because like making leland realize that he is raping his daughter and making laura realize that this demon that's been raping her for years is her father like at the same time is just like crushing i feel like it's also all the more horrifying because one of the depictions that you are confronted with that you have to dwell in when you view Fire Walk With Me, is that it's not simply Leland raping an unwilling Laura. Part of Laura's horror comes from the fact that she is being sexually gratified by Bob. Bob is not just, like, some kind of unwanted demon. He's also skewed her ability to enjoy her own sexuality, so... There's part of her that wants to be satisfied by a James, but then she's off in a cabin with Jacques Renault and Leo getting tied up, hanging out with Ronette, doing all that shit at One Eyed Jack's. Like, Laura's sexuality was... Her, her spirit was affected by this occupation of Bob in her life. And 12 years old pretty formative age for how people are going to develop sexually. So there's some aspect of Bob's appetite satisfaction cycle that then is part of Laura and her her own self-understanding. So once she's confronted then by this mysterious incubus like energy that she's been getting from bob recognizing that it's been her father is the for me the most horrifying moment yeah (laughs) and and when i first saw the film we kind of talked about this a little bit before we started the recording but um when you come from the series and you watch the film i remember seeing it the first time and being disappointed about a number of details about Fire Walk With Me. The fact that it's not the same actress for Donna. The fact that you don't get that resolution from the end Mm. of the series. The fact that Cheryl Lee, rather than being the like composed, mysterious Laura that we know from the series, is now like freaking the fuck out. We get to see every facet of Laura. Everything that Laura could express is almost something that we that we end up having to experience as a part of seeing this end of her life. It's an unbelievable performance. Oh. It is insanely masterful. I can't believe what a phenomenal actress Cheryl Lee is yeah. and how limited her career ends up being. And it's like you get hints of that in the show. Like she's always good like playing Laura and Maddie, but you have no idea like how good of an actress she is until you see this movie. Yeah. Her yeah. range is exquisite. It's like, in, like, it's she insane. Is this character, yeah. And this character is experiencing things that I don't know any equivalent for in any other film. Yeah. When it comes to the story of Laura, Ben, you you kind of uh, you, when when the credits rolled, you comedically asked me like, "Did you get the answers you wanted from it?" And and I said kind of, and it raised more questions as well, but one of the reasons that I I do feel like I did get many answers out of this is I, okay. I didn't get a sense of like positive resolution with Cooper at the end, but I did. I, I feel like I was able to make some sense of the spiritual and psychological events of the series. And I can pin it on one moment in this film. It is, it is when Laura is walking into the, the bar bang, bang, um, <laughs> the roadhouse, uh, the roadhouse yeah. bar. That's right. Cause I, the, the sign, but, um, yeah, when she, when Laura's walking into the roadhouse and she's stopped by the log lady, the tender bows of innocence burn first. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Fuck. Yeah. Thank the kind you, of fire is because I didn't want to misquote it. To put out. Yeah. yeah. And if that doesn't summarize so much of the series, because what, what is one of the most traumatic and, and terrible events that can happen in that part of the country? It is wildfires. It is, you know, like the like fire watches are 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 so prevalent that that idea of of large burns, 
And there's a reason why, like, the logging company is so important, you know, and, like, that, that wildfire coming through. It's another just element of that fractal boomerang. This film, not only does it show us, like, the center of, like, the void, but it shows us how those, those little embers were blown on and it started that whole, that whole blaze. And it's, it all, and it all starts, it's all centered around Laura. And, it, and it's all, Jesus, that first little, you know, like, bit of kindling that just sets off that whole forest fire. Well, yeah, where does the void come And that whole spiritual event. I think, yeah. I think the most important revelation that this film offers in the context of the show is in the series, like, we see over and over again how every single person that Laura came into contact with ended up kind of, like, obsessed and spellbound and like in love with her but what we see of her in the show you i don't think ever really allows us to make that connection with her she's always just like this kind of aloof mysterious like idea the whole mystery of the show is like trying to unravel who she is and why this happened to her but i don't think we ever are really given a good access to finding out why everybody loved her as much as they did until this movie. Yes. And I think that that puts so much of the series into much like sharper clarity because when you see these people who can't stop thinking about Laura even after her death, it's like now you start to see like why you get you actually get to figure out who laura palmer is in this movie yeah that takes uh, i wanted to reflect on something that katie had said earlier Please. that kind of ties in with that which is that we see leland's corruption occurring and we see the splintering of his spirit and we also see that i think what you said was we see that at much, like a much more microscopic level um so it looks almost dramatic like dramatized but it is something that actually happens to people to their spirits um to their humanity and we start to see that process we see how important laura is to people like we see what she means to them but then we start to see that process of her slowly absorbing that possession to an extent there's um there's one scene when she's talking to harold when she's asking him to hide the diary where we see her face change mm. And yeah. then later in the film, after Leland has killed her, his face changes in exactly the same way. And we're starting to see her become Bob. And she even references, like, Bob wants to be in me. Yeah. So this splintering is starting to occur to her as well. Because, like, we know Leland was first infected by Bob probably through molestation. And so this is like an intergenerational transmission of this possession. But for some reason, Bob hasn't been able to inhabit Laura like he wants. Right. Inter right. Which is interesting. She's I've never... not broken. She's not right. broken yet. But you, she says something in the film. I think she's maybe talking to Donna. She says something to the effect of, I'm not the Laura that you think I am. Yeah. Like, that Laura is gone. And it's after you have the scene with the log lady, when the log lady it's says the thing about innocence. after she knows that it's her dad. Too. Yes. And that's when I think her psyche splinters. And yes. she starts to have to really hold this at bay. Like her Then she's fully fracturing. Yeah. You, you're seeing different facets of her and who she can and can't be with different people and different groups in the various contexts that she finds herself in because she's got her intimate relationship with Harold. She's got James. She's got Bobby to get her cocaine fix. She's got Donna to give her her feeling of, of childhood innocence. And, and, and she's got Ronette and she's got Teresa and she has this whole constellation of different energies that she gets to be part and parcel of. But at that point, it's like she splinters into those different facets rather than still being an integral being who has those facets like this protective factor of her not knowing that's her father is gone so whatever was protecting her internally has abandoned her and now she's just left to the wolves and then those parts of her life do start to integrate like when donna comes with her and then she feels a sense of responsibility because there's some part of her 
that wants to just let go and be a part of the darkness. There's a part of her that's yeah. just like, this exists, therefore it has to exist in me. She has this wider metaphysical role that that she functions in. So watching it this time, it occurred to me that, and it, it sounds really obvious, but you're seeing Twin Peaks pre-dead Laura. Yeah. And there's a radical shift that happens in what we get to see of Twin Peaks because Laura has died. Right. You, it's you, now the town, everything that you know about the town is in relationship to her. Mm -hmm. And and people want there to be some element of love because they don't, you know, people die and you don't just want to say the world is dark and everybody dies. You want to say, oh, but she had an effect on people. There was something really special about her. She meant something. Teresa Banks gets no such treatment. And you also see that class divide where Laura has this very comfortable upbringing and it, it brings up a character element about Leland too where Leland has this, this imprint of Bob from his much earlier life but Leland's a lawyer like there's some aspect of Leland's occupation that almost guarantees that he's going to have the power to maintain whatever structures need to be in place for him to continue giving himself over to Bob yeah and that that is such an interesting point with relationship to Sarah Palmer I think how what, like what her role is in the, the trauma in that family. And that makes me think of the dinner table scene um, when he's examining Laura's hands. Oh. And this is right after she's figured out that he's Bob and he's scrutinizing her hands and Laura is frozen in fear and her mother speaks for her throughout the entire conversation. And her mother has decided like what is and isn't defensible about her but then later we see in that scene we see her mom defending her against Leland's inappropriateness later we see that she complicitly takes drugged milk from him and knows that he's doing something untoward with her child but prefers to move into her own sort of darkness right a kind of ignorance that's necessary for her to maintain her quality of life or or whatever creature comfort is implied by the way the Palmers live. But Bob it's set himself true. up with that, right? Like Bob oh. set Leland up with that kind of relationship where he's partnered, he's in a career where he can maintain this. He's partnered with someone who's going to be complicit in it. it there's such yes. a through line of compartmentalization. Yes. And, you know, yes. and oh, okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> the, the, okay, yeah, big big epiphany here. Okay, so um, uh, I, I've I've had this sitting in my head for a moment. I've been trying to, to say it properly because, and I, I still don't think I have it fully, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. Um, so noir noir loves a femme fatale, right? And Laura is fascinating because she is more. She's almost like a a, a fatal femme. Like it is like uh, there's there's sort of an inverse there. I think you keyed into it incredibly well, uh, Katie, talking about how there's a part of her that almost feels a need to accept it because it exists. Um, and uh, it's that that sense of, like... Because a femme fatale is, is, you know, like, essentially it's like death personified, right? And it, Bob is the death that is trying to personify her, that is trying to take her and make mm. her into this agent of death. Well, imagine this agent how of, fucking of, powerful of, that would be. Yes. Like, Leland is one thing, but get an 18-year-old homecoming queen who already has the town wrapped around her finger? What can you do if you're Bob in that situation? Exactly, exactly. And this is like the root of the Black Lodge, right? Like the, like feeding off of sorrow, needing to, to eat this, the, uh, like e e this, these, this evil entity needing to, to eat our pain. And as Bob being this, like this agent of, of death and, and darkness, we see it too in the mother. It's that orgy of evidence um, in her smoking. She's seeking her own death, like the 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 tray. That's what they yeah. having going like ah like when you when you brought her up because like the that shot in the house where there's there's three smoking <laughs> trays 
um, when uh, Laura is is talking to Donna. Uh, three smoking trays filled uh, to a like comedic almost degree of cigarettes. If yes. I had a nickel for every time your mom smoked a cigarette, I'd be, be dead. dead. <laughs> right, like, and it's it's her seeking death in her own yeah. way, and it's it's just her her means of opting out of, of the horror. An escape, mm-hmm. just like she's escaping when she takes- A distraction. The, I'm not gonna look at that. I'm not gonna look at that. And and I found this I'm very, gonna not look at that. Yes. Actively. Yes, the deliberate ignorance yeah. is what fascinates me the most. It's kind of like when I speak to Catholic family members about problems that I have in that religion. <laughs> it's like, look, I get that you think it would be better for me to be Catholic. Since I'm not, I'm going to go ahead and bring up this fact that there are issues with some of the authoritarian natures and, and, and what people are allowed to do when they have a little too much power and what people desire to do when they're in that position and why it is that that someone would seek to derive power by taking away someone else's in that fundamental metaphysical way. What's the currency of a spiritual crime? German Bosia. Mm-hmm. I think the the use of cigarettes as kind of a motif through the film is really interesting. David Lynch goes out of his way after the the bang bang roadhouse bar scene with Donna goes out of his way to shoot a shot of the floor of the bar just covered in cigarettes Mm -hmm. yeah and i find that so interesting because you know the the whole film up to to then and throughout is very much about compartmentalization and kind of trying to distract yourself from the the trauma and the suffering by compartmentalizing everything into little separate things and when those things get blended together it's hard to avoid that you know and when things naturally uh come together there is that suffering and trauma so Um, is it the patterning of there being like I i love that you mentioned that shot of the cigarettes on the ground because it's this i i remember watching it this time and going, I remember floors like that. (laughs) I remember being spaces where you could smoke inside and put the cigarette out on the ground and there would be cigarettes everywhere. But I think it's such a rich shot that I think it's very much intentional in that, you know, the cigarettes were such a symbol with the house earlier. It's the bar is a watering hole for death. Like it, it is, it is a place. Sex and death. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, um. And life too. I mean, you can't discount Julie Cruz's presence. Mm-hmm. Oh, well see, that's the thing is like, that's the front of the bar. Man. Right? Well, no, like... no, 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 no. These are different establishments. That's true. Mm-hmm. They meet at the roadhouse, mm-hmm. which is like a meeting place in the show mm-hmm. where Julie Cruz is always performing. Good point. And then they go to the separate location, yes. the other bar. Probably like, I think in it's Canada. Probably yeah. in Canada because she says bar. welcome yeah. to yeah. Canada. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know if it's supposed to be One Eyed Jacks. I don't think so. But, but she it's says she got kicked out of One Eyed Jacks. Yeah. You know, yeah it's it. it's yeah. somewhere it's somewhere on the other side of the border. That's why you know they go to meet Jacques Renault at the Roadhouse where he works, and then he smuggles them across the border. Canada is the dark land where you can have naked ladies dance. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I find that scene so interesting <laughs> because they have the audio so loud. That they have subtitles over and everything. I actually really like that. Yeah, any odd, uh, you you don't dialogue. see that. You don't see that in movies where like at the club scene. Magnolia. Is they can always. The reminds me of, they yeah. can always like hear each other clearly. But I love that in this one, it's like the music is so loud that they have to subtitle the actors. So it's like I think that it makes it more immersive and like kind of. That that whole set is so like bombastic in terms of like what it projects like sensory wise. And what a cool track to pair with it. The too. music is great. Yes. Yeah, the music, the music is dope. Throughout this movie is amazing. Oh, so yes. much of it yes. is backwards. You know what? It only just occurred to me at this watching that um, you know, there's that 
that line that Harry Dean Stanton has about coffee being uh, Good Morning America. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I was thinking about the soundtrack, watching the film this time around, and I was like, holy shit, these are all American genres. Mm-hmm. And it's all the American genres. You get your rock and roll with, like, the more lighthearted sequences around the school when it's mm-hmm. Laura and Bobby usually. And then you get your cool jazz stuff going on and then you get your blues that it's it's all the great american genres represented in the same soundtrack Uh, almost like i love thinking about twin peaks and david lynch's work generally as an attempt to show the brightest and darkest sides of american culture i think he does a really amazing job of that because we have our desire for freedom and and a kind of libertinism and there's a a a fluid kind of relaxed aspect of what it is to me be american and and that agitation for wanting more freedom and then there's this dark side that is like it's not necessarily the the impact of freedom but uh how people respond when they're unable to do that how how people respond when they're unable to achieve freedoms that are that are promised to them. I'm so glad you brought that up because like for me Twin Peaks has always been like such an association with like Americana in general. Like when I think about Americana as like a genre, Twin Peaks is one of the first things I think of and it has like you so acutely pointed out both the good and the bad like the town is the embodiment of just a beautiful like sweet little slice of america where the diner is everybody's friendly the the pie is good the coffee's good everybody knows each other's names everybody's friendly and then you have like the truly disgusting underbelly that ju- is just like beneath the surface with like drugs and murder and child prostitution. To me, the most compelling bit is being able to toe the line between them in in its own very tangible way. Something like the log lady where... The log lady's not necessarily that super welcoming face that you get at the diner. She's a little unnerving because you don't really know what she's talking about. But at the same time, she's she's walking in both worlds. Yeah. She just like Mrs. Tremont and her grandson. Yeah. These dwellers on the threshold are absolutely a part of the space and they get tied up in these kind of energy vacuums that end up being created by the perpetuation of evil and good because the good things that Laura is doing have their own effect on her environment. She is inspiring people's love. She is doing things to, to bring good into people's lives. Yeah. And it's almost like that in itself brings more of the darkness to her. There is a lot of uh, duality, as it, thematic duality, and then some examples of the oneness as well. Well, uh, I think the uh, he, he refers to himself. I think he names himself as the right arm in this um, uh, for the first time. But the the the, the little the man, yeah, uh, the the lodge. Yes, yeah, he's um, the arm. But there's the there's a uh, there's one thing he says in the TV series, and that's doppelganger. Him. Right, like he gets yeah. into that, and that's that that duality and mm-hmm. those 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 multiples, and it's it's not only doppelgangers, but it's again it's it's fractal. And well, uh, doppelgangers great... are a huge theme of Twin Peaks. They are, of course. And uh, an interesting one is is an inverse of Laura Palmer, and it's not who you think I'm going to mention. It is um, oh uh, shoot, uh, uh, Audrey. Uh, I, I wanted to bring up Audrey from the show because, and especially now, and I, I hadn't thought about it this way until watching this film, but. Audrey experiences so many of the same points as Laura mm-hmm. does, and but she is able, she is able to escape it. She's able to skirt past all of it, and assumedly, actually achieve her dream. Yeah, she stays devoted to goodness. Yeah, through the whole show, and she's the last person you'd expect to. 
Right, because she's like the the snooty rich daughter of of Ben Horn. She's like a chaos agent. Yeah, remember yeah. That she's scene? awesome. She's that the scene she in is. the pilot where she sticks the pencil into in the, the receptionist cup. Yeah, yeah, and then just gleefully watches it spill all over the table. I, I just recently rewatched the pilot, and I was like, this is genius yeah and her shenanigans at the department store yes yeah. oh my god and when she gets all the norwegians to leave yeah. by telling them about laura being killed oh yeah. my god yeah like so tr- like agent of chaos absolutely like she is she's just a little heiress like running around like causing like all well, that, sorts of chaos and like to that's be, why her to development her into... yeah that's why her development over the course Hero. of the show is so interesting because that's how she starts but by the end of the series like she is pretty much solely altruistic and, and you know you know where the, the the turn is it is when she is denied by agent cooper mm-hmm. like yeah when when agent cooper like when uh, he represents responsible authority yes. yeah. yeah when when he 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 essentially like yeah does one of those wholesome acts you can do uh i remember like i was you know watching it with you guys like during during that scene of the show like i i just about stood up i was just like yes yeah. like thank you like you don't see this moment in tv ever and it is so needed and it is so important like and i think like especially like as a teacher knowing like those those responsible boundaries is it's just so goddamn important and we love to show like the 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 taboo element of it and like in television like it's so popular to 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 play up the the fun and the escapism of like those reprehensible acts and and to finally get it in a show where cooper is just like does the right goddamn thing you know and and just be like nope nope you're you're very young and the this case is very important and like and he he knows he would do harm and he he recognizes that and and she's able to yeah yeah you know like like grow from it as well and and through that like yeah like as you said, like, like, like being like a, like a, a positive, like figure of authority in her life, which Laura doesn't get like her positive figure of authority, like is, is possessed by a demon. Yeah. Like, and, Cooper and so Audrey, like from that moment person. is yeah. able to, to carry on. And it's, it's, and it, and it goes beyond that too. We, we see like Audrey at one eye jacks, like wearing the mask and her father makes advances towards her. Like it's the same we see that same parallel once yeah. again. Yeah. It's like, what's the difference between autopilot and integrity? A lot of what's happening with those people's lives is that they're in autopilot because they're fulfilling roles that they're expected to fulfill. And then someone like Cooper comes in and he's not doing that because he hasn't had the luxury. He's had to occupy many different kinds of mental spaces and situations. Uh, I mean, even even at the point where we get this this uh, preview or or uh, like behind the scenes view of what's going on at the FBI prior to Laura's death, where there is this spooky action at a distance going on, it is a blue rose case which you get to dig into a little bit more, and all of this uncertainty makes Cooper a stronger, more integral psyche to kind of absorb all that is going on in Twin Peaks. And we can rely on Cooper to guide us and hold us through that experience in the series. And I think that's one of the jarring things about Fire Walk With Me is that you get a disjointed Cooper. You get a Cooper who's simultaneously captured in in the television and overlaid with Philip Jeffries and in the room and known to Jeffries, even though he's not familiar with Jeffries, and suddenly Cooper's integrity shatters in a similar way that it does at the end of season two. So what you go into Fire Walk With Me thinking is, good, I'm gonna get my Cooper back. This is going to help me with all of my problems. Fuck your expectations. Yeah. <laughs> and then well, nope. at Lynch is just reinforcing the idea that like we can we can explore what resolution and restitution of these kinds of crimes looks like. But it only happens in the imaginal realm and it's kind of up to all of us to become our own version of Agent Cooper. 
we're all investigating this case. We're all having to occupy the psychological space of every character. So what do we as individuals then have as our responsibility when it comes to our own integrity? Can we stand to look at the darkness? Can we stand to deal with the, the obvious nihilism? Do we instead go Sarah Palmer and pretend like it doesn't really exist and that was just a movie? Having to see the root of the horror like gives its own sense of closure with the series. I know that there's still a return for, for me to watch. Um, but while I didn't get positive resolution with Cooper, what I did get was an understanding of how it brought Cooper to that point and what, you know, what, what brought Cooper there and what has killed him. What has, what has eaten his consciousness? You know, what, what has, how has Bob taken him? Twin Peaks showed me the site where a forest had burned down. And this film allowed me to see how it started. This allowed me to see the wildfire that occurred here. And it was a gender reveal party. <laughs> <laughs> gender reveal party for two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, there's closure in that. Or at least there would be if this new series didn't also exist, which I'm very curious about. But oh, uh, it's not going to give you any extra closure. Um, <laughs> so, but but at least like we'll we'll hear like I, okay, I didn't get resolution, but I got closure. I'm interested. I was just wondering to myself, what is Cooper's? How does this illustrate what made him vulnerable to corruption? Right. So how does the show and and Firewalk with Me illustrate that? I'm not sure if I feel like I have closure there that his vulnerability seems to be having his heart open in a sense. So that's fascinating messaging. I think that part of it is that Cooper, <coughs> Cooper, I don't think ever does anything wrong. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but like just off the top of my head, I can't, I can't pick a moment, pick it a moment where Cooper isn't like one. Yeah. the platonic ideal. But like, I think it, it is the opposite of that. It is just showing us like how, how like something incredible can can be can be destroyed well it's almost the horror of it is that right you can't pinpoint the vulnerability you can't pinpoint you can't guard against the black lodge has existed since the dawn of man if not before we know that by the cave and it has taken a very very long time for these entities to feed off of this sorrow and to grow strong enough to take something like Cooper. And I think that that is what we learned from this because it is it is the eating, it is the devouring appetite. Yeah, that we gained from this film. Like that is that's a that's an element that we didn't necessarily see before. We saw it's like a like a dark force and things are harmed by it, but why? What is the motive? The motive is to eat. We know this now. And, and there's a part of everyone that's vulnerable yes. to this possession. Well, that's the thing is like, that's how I think that's how it happens to Cooper is he opens himself up to it because he has to enter the Black Lodge to save Annie yeah. mm-hmm. because otherwise he is incorruptible. That's why to get to him, Wyndham Earl has to take Annie, who he loves, and put her in a such dire position that Cooper has to open himself to that corruption to even be able to enter the Black Lodge. Has no choice but to confront his shadow self. And because when otherwise, you're as yeah. Perfect as Cooper, whatever the opposite of that, how do you overcome yeah. something that's as evil as Cooper is good? What chance do you have? So, almost in a sense, his cardinal sin is playing the hero yeah whoa exactly because he's like cleveland said otherwise he's the platonic ideal he is like completely pure he has no ounce of corruption in him at all so he has to willfully open himself up to it in order to invite it in oh yeah like like cooper like from the beginning of the show like he's he's just like the 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 embodiment of positivity uh, and out of an FBI agent, you just don't see it. Like the F- FBI agents are always so like dour in sh- in films, and like the detective in noir. And again, like why this show like subverts noir so well. Like and <laughs> the the soundtrack is so purely noir, and and it still it, it manages to subvert it and also capture like the dark side better than like so much of noir can. 
Well, that's such but, an interesting comparison like, you made about Chinatown because a lot of the elements that are different from noir are like meditation. Like he's a, he the elements of Eastern influence. Yes. Well, are... and, and who is the detective in noir? But like a, a, a dark, constantly drinking, like miserable, like bad. Right. And that's not right. Yeah, that's totally and the someone... Cooper is the complete opposite of that. Like he, yeah, and someone who's t- carrying so much baggage they couldn't possibly be present in any moment. How stoked <laughs> is Cooper? about the Douglas firs like so just stoked. just the basic <laughs> you've been around people like that I've had moments myself like that where I'm confronted by some simple beauty of nature or uh, excited about anything excited about a movie damn good exci- cup of coffee excited yeah. about a damn good cup of coffee and people get suspicious people get a little on, on guard like I don't know how authentic this can be. And that's one of Cooper's great strengths is that none of it is a put on. Yeah. He's not pretending to be excited about the Douglas firs. That is absolutely his perception. Genuine enthusiasm. Mm, yes, that's spontaneous. Yeah. There's a fan theory. And I I find it particularly fascinating. Um, and I encountered it uh, leading into that. One of y'all might have mentioned it. I don't remember. But there is a fan theory that Cooper is autistic, and I love that idea, personally, uh, that, like, a lot of his, like, centered, like, fascination. There there aren't too many, like, autistic characters in television that are, like, portrayed in, like, a, like a functioning, like, positive aspect. That's part of why I love that idea, uh, or that, that, that sort of fan, you know, concept. Just showing, like, a functioning, like... The humanity and not the diagnosis. Yes! Thank you. Thank you for putting that in a much, much better way. (laughs) I can see how you could make the argument. I would definitely say that Cooper is not necessarily neurotypical, but as far as his capacity for... And, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but Cooper does seem to have a, a deep emotional well of empathy that he shares with other characters and is able to occupy that space outside of his own purview. For instance, when he's interacting with Audrey, when Audrey is just so desperately wanting his attention and his uh, approval and to take risks so that he'll notice her and she tries to give herself to him. She presents herself to him like, like a gift and he wants to be open to her without violating his own moral code or boundaries that he tries to tell her that she should have. So I, I think that that level of emotional complexity could deter one from making that fan theory totally fleshed out, but... It's a fan theory. Yeah. Like, if, there, if it ever was, it's like, no, it, it is, like, I, I'll, I'll be the first to say, like, I, it's a, like, it's a, an idealized projection, um, mm. I think, if anything. Yeah. Like, it's, but, like, like no more than, like, like uh, taking joy out of, like, data from Star Trek. I don't know, I, I think it's a fun, it's a fun concept, but beyond that, no, no, there's, there are plenty of moments where he doesn't exhibit, like, associative behavior. I think definitely in Fire Walk With Me, and even in the pilot, before he starts to warm up to the people of Twin Peaks, you definitely get more of that, I'm trying to be the unaffected observer Mm -hmm. vibe from Cooper. He might be getting excited about things, but he doesn't necessarily care about anyone in his environment, except maybe Diane. it's, It's such that, like you said before, it's such an earnest joy and enthusiasm towards minute things that makes it seem suspect at first because you're so used to people being jaded and you yeah. know just torn down by the earth that seeing this you know unabashed enthusiasm is is unexpected yeah especially when you think about the fact that he's coming out of his relationship with Caroline mm-hmm. and Wyndham Earl uh, maybe there's part of him that is a bit disassociated at that point in time where he's trying to rebuild the Dale Cooper that he knows himself to be. He's using Diane as a foil to do so. He's trying to regain whatever is the best of himself after going through a really dark, really dark period. And maybe that's also too part of what makes him vulnerable 
is that he yeah. has seen a little bit of that darkness and and part of that too speaks to the idea that that you don't get a darkness like bob without having a corresponding drive an appetite for immense power. That's one of the reasons Wyndham Earl was so terrifying to me when I was watching season two, and people shit on season two all the time. But I thought Wyndham Earl was a very effective villain. When he's torturing mm-hmm. um, Garland Briggs. Oh, yeah. And and when he is ju- just like this kind of nihilistic glee that that revolves around his character i'm just like oh shit no you are getting way too close to a black hole now katie you need to get out of this show you need to get out now quick before they take you into the black lodge oh man no mm-hmm. now we're in the black lodge <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. uh yeah it's i think it's said often in uh like uh tropey fantasy like that that concept of like the the brightest light casts the darkest shadow. <laughs> yeah, sort of sort of thing but truisms like, are true sometimes truisms are true though like yeah absolutely and i, I think like i, I hate to, to put such a hackneyed like veneer over it but I, I think yeah like that that's definitely i think the the heart of so much of the show is, is that idea of the the brightest lights casting the darkest shadows and what is fire if not that i i agree with you katie i think windham earl is a brilliant villain and i think the reason he gets shit on is because in many ways he is extremely cartoonish the whole gag of him like dressing up in different disguises to like yeah. do his his dirty work Slightly around yeah. town yeah. like Light it's yeah. like it's ri- it's ridiculous but at the same time it's what makes him, like you said, that unbridled glee at the harm he's inflicting is what makes him the necessary perfect character to bring Bob back into the world after Leland's death. Because Leland dying does banish Bob successfully. Because as we've seen, like Bob has not, especially in Fire Walk With Me, Bob has not been able to possess Laura like he wants, and Laura's kind of death drive, her her spiral into self-destructive behavior is, I think, to force Bob to kill her so he can't possess her. Right. Because as is said in this movie, he says, I want to be you or I want to kill you. And so she is trying to force his hand into killing her in order to break the cycle, essentially. And with Leland's death in the show, that is effective. Bob is gone from the show until Wyndham Earl shows back up. Well, and... uh, the owls are not what they seem, though. Oh, I've got something. The owls, I mean, obviously, Twin Peaks, like, there is a direct portal to the Black Lodge, so, like, its influence is still heavy in the town. The veil is thin. That's why Wyndham Earl is there. But Bob is not seen working through other people in the second season after Leland dies. He has not been able to possess anybody else, and it seems like... Sarah, I think you hit on something that Leland was probably possessed through an act of molestation when he was young, and that it maybe is how Bob has to move between hosts, is through there's like a sexual aspect to it, uh, like an STD or something. Um, or at least like some just kind a of corrupting act. trauma. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like some kind of subway. some kind of corrupting trauma and he's not able to get into somebody else before mm-hmm. it, you in that way before Leland dies. So like yeah, the owls are not what they seem. Like the Black Lodge is there, but it's only when Wyndham Earl shows up and is like actively trying to get into the Black Lodge and is inflicting as much suffering as possible in order to make that barrier more permeable. Mm -hmm. And that's what allows Bob back in. And once Cooper and Wyndham Earl are able to enter the Black Lodge, then Bob is able to 
come back into our world in as the bad Cooper, as the Cooper doppelganger. Well, I think too that there are uh, there are several scenes, I, if I remember correctly, uh, where I was pretty drunk through some parts of season two, uh, where um, uh, Wyndham is uh, uh, where Wyndham is literally flipping a coin. Do I remember that correctly? Do I was there were there scenes where he's like he's like flipping a coin, or am I am I imagining things? I don't know. I yeah. think he does use a coin, though. I could swear Wyndham, like... Wyndham Earl has all kinds of... Yeah, he has his, yeah. The flute yeah. is the best, like, right. I by far. I think he does flip a coin related sure. to something he does to Leo. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, he's, like, flipping yeah. a coin. Oh, right, and yeah. I, I think that's... Again, it's it. he and Cooper, two sides, same coin. You know, that is whole it? same situation, light and dark. And, uh... No, I'm I'm all for it, and I, I do. I like Wyndham. Uh, he's the anti-Cooper. Yeah, the, the anti-Coop. And, uh... <laughs> Um, the, there's, there's definitely something in that. I, I want to talk about the owls not being what they seem. If that's cool. Uh, I have a dumb theory, uh, and it's almost certainly wrong, and I want, uh, please feel free, uh, to, uh, discount it. Uh, but... Will do. The, the ending of this film, Laura is told that, like, uh, essentially she'll, she'll see her fall when the, the angels are not there for her. The angel literally disappears from her photograph. Yeah. Um, on the wall or print. The and, painting, yeah. Uh, and then she goes through her, her horrible, like, like she's, she's sent through these horrible events, and then out the other side of the Black Lodge. And that's, that was something I wasn't expecting. There, an angel descends in the Black Lodge, like, and essentially lifts her away. Well, like, it's is, the Red Room, so it's, right. it's, a, it's the space where the dwellers on the threshold are between. able to navigate between... Black Lodge, White Lodge. It's, yeah, the it's the, the waiting room as it's mm -hmm. described in the show. Right, thank you. Uh, and and that, that is a very important point. Uh, and sorry, the I like waiting the waiting room. room. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and and she, is, she is taken away and out of the waiting room and into Bliss, Nirvana, etc. Interesting. And, and here, here's the thing about that, though, right? I was waiting this whole movie for an owl. I'm a big, owls are my favorite creature uh had the chance to hold some great horned owls on my arms several times in my life i'm a big fan of a great horned owl not a fan of seeing a villainized uh owls rock and uh <laughs> they're uh, kind of spooky though they, oh well that's why i love them you know I, yeah i know I, I think the spooky owls in twin peaks are great they, they are and they are definitely not what they seem and i love that and uh let's so, anyway they're always accompanied by like dark music but what often precipitates the shots of the owls in Twin Peaks is the shots of the stoplights. We're often given, like, the images of, like, the, the, the hanging stoplights. Mm -hmm. da -da -da, and then, like, it's a shot of an owl. Oh, they're not what they seem. Mm, they fly off. And the last moment of goodness that Laura has is with James in front of a stoplight and her running away there. And we talk about ghosts being, like entities that you know are kind of stepping in and watching over us or looking after us or uh, hanging around sites where where they were harmed and the idea of the owls being angels very strongly appeals to me that that the owls are laura watching was it's I, sort of my take from it, and it, I see where you're very, coming from. It's, it's very <laughs> that them not being nothing what they that, seem that is nefarious. This. What's that? That them not being what they seem isn't necessarily saying they're nefarious. No, because the show is telling you spooky uh -huh. owl, and then we're told they're not what they seem. Well, maybe so. It's, maybe uh, maybe I mean, we see the owls right. overlaid with Bob multiple times That's in the true. show. Like, oh, I shit. think. Okay, well, there's the discount. I, mean, okay, yeah, I, yeah, I think. Oh, well, God but, damn it! Ah, I right. think it's pretty. <laughs> like, I have a hard time thinking of the use of owls in the show and not seeing them as 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 a malicious force. Well, they're yeah. like if mercurial. This, if you do take this deeper, though, I can see what you mean. Like, what if they're overlaid with Bob because they're the balancing force? Mm. Okay, yeah, or just, just just watching entities in general, right? Like, they're not owls, they're mm -hmm. just observers. They, you know, like... Hermetic, almost. Like, like mm -hmm. almost a messenger from the other side. So maybe the energy of Bob can piggyback on an right. owl, but an owl is not necessarily wedded to that negative polarity of that energy. I definitely, I could definitely see that. When I, when I think about the feeling that the owls gave me, I think about the feeling that I get about Mrs. Tremont slash Mrs. Chalfont. 
and her mm -hmm. her grandson where they're they don't seem like overwhelmingly positive or negative entities but they're strongly associated with the most substantial examples of both the worst and the best mm -hmm. and it's through those liminal spaces that they're able to communicate one or the other through the painting that Laura sees herself as a part of to be able to see around the corner mm -hmm. and and that's also what makes it a mercurial or or hermetic kind of vision it's like you can know more and I can bring you more information whether I'm uh, an old lady or a dancing boy or an owl or a painting they're all radio transmitters the Tremonts in particular, I'm really glad you brought them up as like a neutral force and because they are they are fascinating and like they, they are these these people who have sort of like fallen into the claims of like the waiting room, you know, like as they're and, and have just tapped into the whatever is beneath Twin Peaks. And so that they've sort of become like the log lady as well, like they've become these sort of like radio transmitters for for spirituality like uh, mm -hmm. of this force like the log lady is like much more positive you know in that respect but then she's she is like like up on the fire tower you know like up on the spiritual fire tower and is able to like to make these call signs and she might not be able to to recognize them as that uh my my namesake lost his son in world war one and did a great deal of auto writing he was a very heavy spiritualist, and uh, his wife made him stop after a while because, like, some of the things he was writing were, were just too close to what his son would write. There's something to that. I, I don't know. That concept of being a, a spiritual transmitter mm -hmm. like that and just, just keying into those radio waves, yeah. uh, those, those spectral waves, is, is, is fascinating to me. And allowing yourself to become... A tarot card to a to, to be yes and, and and to become like a thought form right like a concept personified a to, to just be a symbol to just mm -hmm. be the the ace of cups and mm -hmm. the, the tree monsters are that if anything like they've they've just become like the actually the tree of cups isn't even a tarot card but like, <laughs> i don't know if there is <laughs> the cups, like, the, you know, like the probably some swords in there uh, maybe wands <laughs> Um, but you know, just just to, to essentially like like represent like the wheel, like to just be like 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 to 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 chime it, to, to key into that yeah. force mm -hmm. and just just become like this this odd like this like spiritual object yeah. um, is awesome. Like it's so well. Cool. That's kind of like, what happens to Laura too. That's almost Laura's sacrifice is to become something like an archetypal emblem of spiritual progress. <laughs> Because she kind of sacrifices herself. Oh, no, kind of. She, you know, she knows enough about what's going on to know that things aren't going to end up white picket fence for her. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit too much damage that has happened for her to, even before she knows that Bob is Leland, Laura already knows I've been too compromised. I'm going to try my best to be the best, most helpful version of Laura Palmer I can be. But I know this is not going to end well. Something that we were talking about earlier is the scene where Donna and Laura are together in the bar. And um, there's a moment in which Jacques, Jacques, Jacques Renaud uh, reveals to Laura that Teresa asked about her father. Right? Yeah. Um, and so in that moment, you can see Laura putting these pieces together, right? Teresa is dead. My father is Bob. Teresa asked about my father. What does that mean? Right. And then we see her sitting in the booth. She's escaping that, right? She's pulling a Sarah. She's not looking at that. She's with Ronette. She's flirting with the John. She's getting like sexual gratification from him. And then she sees Donna across the room and she snaps out of it right she remembers the stake she remembers that threat that her dad is bob and you can see her pop back into herself but it's like that phasing in and out that's happening constantly in this film as she's starting to disintegrate and she's starting to put everything together and it's like she's becoming like you were saying like this she has to make a choice like a do or die choice and she has to to do it while her judgment is still 
while she still can. Yeah, like while before, she still has the before capacity. Bob takes her. Yeah. yeah, I think one of the scenes that sticks with me the most when I think about this movie is the scene with Leland and Laura in the car. Yeah. Oh um, yeah. That's an intense and scene. I oh think my god. That yeah. scene goes really well into what you're you're talking about because I think one of the most tragic moments for Leland as a character comes in a flashback in that scene where when he's sitting in the car having a sort of realization, you know, when he is uh, by the motel and he sees in in the room uh, Rana and Laura and realizes he is set to go in there and he realizes this is not him and it's such a tragic realization because you realize that the the compartmentalization between him and bob through him is breaking down and in that destruction there's so much devastation and you see it just in his face and yeah in the fantastic I took performance some notes of the things that he's like coming to terms with in yeah. that scene this watch and he's realizing that he's having sex with his daughter but only in secret Right. Then he realizes that some of the things that he's done have caused this situation where he could pay to have sex with his daughter. Um, And he's also realizing that he will, in fact, have sex for money, but that he doesn't want to do that with his daughter knowing. So he's having all of yeah his own compartments are just crumbling. I think Bob is allowing them to, so he can reap the most <laughs> sorrow from them. Yeah, the most Garmenbosia he can is by allowing each of them to come to parallel realizations of who each other and is. And I, I find yeah. that sequence where you know after they've been screamed at uh, and they pull into the mechanics. Yeah. When they're both just sitting there kind of almost having their own realizations at the same time yeah. next to each other. I, I find that whole sequence so stunning. Yeah. Because it is that, you know, suffering incarnate just coming to that realization and everything breaking down. And Ray Wise and Cheryl Lee just give such fucking good performances <laughs> in that scene in particular. Like there's so much written on their faces and it. I Come just, out of the blue. Light. Just cannot be. <laughs> What's the world coming to? <laughs> yeah. Cannot be understated how fucking good they are. Uh, the one uh, thing I want to mention is David Bowie's. No, 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 no. Please, please, yes. I wanted to ask. Oh, yeah. I want to ask. Can someone please explain David Bowie to me? <laughs> That's all. Please. Please, someone okay, explain. Well, okay. Someone so tell me about David Bowie. Back in 1964. <laughs> <laughs> The spiders from Mars. Yes, yes. All right, but 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 for real. Like I need a little bit more data on that. I was I was very confused. He's Philip Jeffries. He's a FBI agent who disappeared on and, a Blue Rose case. Yes, and no one's seen him. Okay, so he's a foreshadowing of what what is to come for Cooper, essentially. But like, narratively, like that's sort where of, like, but also just kind of to show that the FBI has been dealing with these kind of like supernatural adjacent kind of cases the blue rose cases that it it sort of it gives more context for cooper coming into twin peaks and accepting all of the supernatural so readily is that the fbi already kind of knows about this stuff yeah okay and like Cooper had a dream that that was going to happen. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, like, this is our explanation for why Cooper is and, like, why this, like, this, like, facet of the FBI is, like, open mm-hmm. for, like, yeah. they're open to, like, the supernatural. Kind of cool. X-Files <laughs> shit. Well, yeah. And he also okay, highlights the point, duality but, of Cooper, right? Because we get to see him come in and he questions, who do you think that is there? Right? He says that who to do Gordon. Who do you think that, that is yeah. there? Yeah, Bowie, Bowie really sells that, man. He really does. And when you... When you all get through the return, it will make a little bit more sense. Okay. There, that you definitely get more of a fleshed out experience of Jeffries mm-hmm. and his relationship to the greater story. Um, I mean, in okay, a really cool. peculiar that's, way. That's that's exciting, <laughs> but, actually. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember reading something about how it was uh, <laughs> they they were coaching Bowie on a specific kind of Louisiana accent for Philip Jeffries. Yeah, I don't know how successful it is, I must say. <laughs> it might just be because it's weird to hear that accent coming out of David Bowie's mouth. I can't tell if he's doing a good job or a bad job. I'm leaning towards bad job. <laughs> it's... Yeah, I mean, gr growing up in the South, like, it, it's so tricky, like, because I'll hear, see Northern folks, like, see a Southern accent on television, and they'll be like, man, no one from the South actually sounds like that, do they? Like, they don't all sound like cartoon characters, and I'm like... And it's like, well... Yeah, you oh, know, like Daniel some Craig folks and really Knives out. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, I, that, that, like, yeah, that, that Georgia draw, like, yeah, that's a thing. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. Uh, David Bowie. Yes, uh, I'm glad we mentioned him. Yeah. Yes, he's uh, not there for very long, but but worth talking about. I was just looking over my notes, and one thing that came to me in this viewing that hadn't really occurred to me at prior viewings is this, and we've already been talking a little bit about dichotomies, but the presence of these supernatural phenomena happening on the left side of the body seems very significant to me oh and Whoa. you're right i yeah. did not even did it's not even the left that. arm that goes numb anytime there's that kind of an aberration even when laura then discovers that it's leland who's been raping her when you approach the palmer house you are you're facing the house from the left she sees bob then it goes into the appetite, the throat, and then you come out and see the house from the right. And because it's the left, the left hand that's going numb and the left ring finger that's getting the mark, to me that, that kind of spoke to interests I've had lately in like the esoteric intellectual environments and how people will go like full Aleister Crowley left hand the left hand path because they yeah. think it's edgy and because they think that that's the best way to be not amoral but anti-moral I think it's a really fascinating aberration of a what seems to be a natural inclination to to oppose the status quo but to me, the significance of it being on the left consistently is that like liminal space where you don't necessarily have everything logically organized and arranged and sequentially expected, prophesied in that way. If it's the left side, it's the right brain. It's the shadow self. Mm. It's like, yeah. don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it is the shadow self. And it is the confrontation. Actually, that brings something else to mind in the show. The one-armed man who's possessed by Mike, the counterpart to Bob, he becomes benevolent when he severs the left arm. Mm -hmm. In order to like break his relationship with Bob, where they kill together, he severs the left arm, and we see the left arm then personified as the little man dancing in the waiting room. It was also cool, I noticed at this viewing, that when you're in the Black Lodge at the end and Mike and the arm are talking to Bob, they have to reconnect yeah. before they have that discussion with Bob. They, they're they physically touching. Yeah. Mike is holding on to his arm yeah. in order to request... Or rather, his arm, arm is yeah. holding on to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But cool. when I saw the face of God... It's much like, like a tarot card inverted. All right. Well, I think it's time to rate this. We have been all over this fucking movie and Twin Peaks in general. Uh, why don't we start with Sarah and we'll work our way around the circle. What would you rate Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me out of five? Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me is one of my favorite films. I think the obvious answer is it is a five for me. Ben? This movie's so interesting because it's it's so dependent on the well of context from the show and I think it it rewards you for it in so many ways I used to really dislike this movie well the first time I saw it just because it's it's a lot and it's a lot different than the show um, but I've come to appreciate it so much more and I, I really appreciated our conversation about it 
Um, it's such a dense movie. There's so much going on. I guess I would give it a four and a half out of five. I think there's still more to be explored before I give it a five, but I'm definitely open to that in the future. It's probably going to be a moment till I, I can manage to watch it again. Uh, this one this one was a pretty heavy film uh, for me, and like I said, I, I, I tend to gravitate towards the the light <laughs> of, of like the the wholesome elements of, of Twin Peaks or what are, are, are many of the the points that, that strongly appealed to me the, the double R diner and so many of the the wholesome characters and even like uh, oh at the the front desk of the police station uh, the and the, what are their Lucy. names Lucy Lucy and Andy. And, Andy. and Andy it's like dumb as bricks and I I, I love them like 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 and there's something so delightfully wholesome uh, in those those elements of the show and I, I tend to gravitate towards that and again it's that that always like that darkness in the periphery is fascinating and, and horrifying and circling around it is incredible but to to just be plunged dead dead center into this void is difficult and uh, it's gonna be a moment till I can I can manage to watch it again uh, I, I know I will because like there's there's so many small things to find it is still a phenomenal film and I, I, I'd I be hard-pressed to not give it five. What an incredible way to conclude this experience. Uh, like, so, minus the return. No, it's, it's a five. It's a five for me. Cleve, I, I, don't, I don't envy your position because if I had had to rate this film after seeing it for the first time, it would not get the five out of five that I give this film now. And the reason... Firewalk with me is a five out of five for me is that I feel that every time I see the film, it gets better. It improves on itself each time. It rewards every viewing with something new, some new connection to be made. And then even with the addition of the 18 hours of new content that happened with The Return, which I hope you enjoy... Fire Walk With Me is still just as, if not more potent in the face of of that additional content. It really acts as a cornerstone of form and content for the series. And because I love the series so much and it was so formative for me in um, kind of taking all of my taste in the avant-garde and the strange and making it accessible and making it tangible that for me is is why it holds such a special place because it's hard to hold all of that in the palm of your hand and david lynch i think did that in a really masterful way with this film and regardless of how audiences took it or received it or or responded to it in the past i think it's the kind of film that only gets better with age and um so i'm sticking to it i don't think i'll ever rate it less than a five out of five at this point yeah i'm i'm with you uh i didn't enjoy it as much the first time i saw it and i think my letterbox rating is uh considerably lower than what i'm going to rate it now um but like we've really even in this almost two hour long episode like only scratched the surface of what can be found in this film and like i do think it really does as with most david lynch movies get much better with subsequent rewatches because it's extremely dense um i was gonna give it a four and a half out of five i was gonna take away half a star uh for Laura Flynn boyle not being in it um but you know after after the discussion we've had and like some of my own personal revelations on this viewing i'm still gonna give it a, a perfect five out of five uh, oh this has got to be a golden pot i'm gonna give it a five <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we 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 swayed you. Um, yeah, I I no, I'm kind of with you. It's like I I think that it's only gonna get better on subsequent rewatches, like Katie said. So it's like, even if there's some stuff that still feels like it's missing, like it it should it should be a a, a perfect rating. 
Absolutely. Um, uh, I did. I did remember one or two things. I did want to mention. Uh, during the podcast we're so sorry. I know oh my two God. hours. Uh, I have to edit this just, tomorrow morning. I'm sorry. Uh, just, uh, uh, that, I, I hope you leave that uh, in there. I love one of one of one of Laura's most relatable uh, elements is that she, uh, is her disdain for James. That's that's all. <laughs> yes. Okay. No. I'm. I'm. Wait, I am glad you brought that wait, up. Gobble, There's gobble. a line. There's Emo. a line. There's a line. Gobble gobble, James. It's not. How do you know what she likes? What was it? Okay, it's uh, you always hurt the ones you love, and the ones you pity. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure you pity James? That like, man Himbo that James. cut me to the core. Himbo Holy James. shit! Uh, oh hell yeah. That's all. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a it's it's a golden pod. It's in there with the rest. It's a, a unanimous perfect score. Um, so if for some reason you've listened to this whole thing and you haven't seen Twin Peaks, what or, are you doing? Or, <laughs> yeah, like sorry, Jesus I'm Christ, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I want to give. We'll we'll do our normal plugs in just a minute, but I do want to give. Uh, Katie and Sarah a huge shout out and thank you for coming on this show both of y'all always make us seem much smarter than we are and uh, negate some of the dumb guy energy from the show uh, that I that we normally take so much pride in so I, I really I really appreciate I really really appreciate uh, oh it's pride. Yeah, it's pride it's pride I take pride yeah. I don't know how much you're gonna edit out of my right hand fucking dumb shit comment but you know i'll probably i'll probably edit that out for you i'll probably edit that out for you but um yeah so anyway uh thank you guys so much uh just in advance um now for the normal stuff uh if you like the show leave us a five star rating on apple Podcasts. share an episode with your friends write us a nice review you know the drill uh you can follow us on twitter at pod people pod and uh check out our letterboxd page at letterboxd.com slash pod people pod where you'll find a list of all the films we've talked about on the show with our average ratings and links to those reviews and you can see the ever-growing uh uh, hall of the golden pods where twin peaks fire walk with me now resides with its fellows i'm on twitter at deep state ozzy i'm on twitter at mr sheets and i'm occasionally tweeting for light arc studios we further progress on it stairs back stay tuned coming up soon um uh there might be some cool stuff in the works for that so uh just stay just keep your eyes out on our twitter account um, and also, if you like spooky, esoteric, weird void stuff, which, I mean, if you're listening to this podcast, I would assume you do, uh, you'll be able to see some of my uh, spooky void paintings in the upcoming uh, game, The Dread X Collection Volume 3. Uh, so keep your uh, eyes, ears, and whatever else tuned uh, for that. Uh, and uh, you can also see my work on ArtStation. Uh, just search Cleveland Mosier for other astral, creepy, spooky, and sometimes not spooky, but wholesome art. Just paintings in general. You, you know how it is. Uh, Katie, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Sure. You can follow me at Lambly Optic on Instagram. That's just like the animal lamb, L-Y, Optic on Instagram. And... Just like Cleveland was saying, if you're into the dark esoteric, I've recently been uh, uh, enjoying a, a review of my foray into Auschwitz concentration camp a la 2014. So if you're into digging into some of the more esoteric and dark aspects of human nature, and you want to take that journey with me, I hope that you'll come check out some of my photography in that context. You can also find out more about me and my work by visiting www.lambleyoptic.com. Sarah, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Sure, you can find my nature pictures on Instagram. Ooh. My handle is cyclone78. And I, if you have your own personal bob that you would like to keep at bay <laughs> i am a licensed therapist you can find on psychology <laughs> today <laughs> awesome um 
Sweet, yes. Uh, thank both of y'all for coming so much. I totally forgot. Next week, it's Halloween. How could I forget? Uh, our next episode will be coming out on Halloween. We're going to be talking about the original creep show, screenplay by Stephen King, directed by George Romero. Um, that's going to be a fun one. So uh, come hang out with us on Halloween. And uh, until next time, I hope that fire is not walking with you. (laughs) 